Boone County, Kentucky is known for legendary woodsman Daniel Boone. Now add Henrietta Wood, born there in 1819. She can claim what most enslaved Americans cannot. Wood sued for slavery reparations and won the largest award ever paid to a former slave. This is her story. Wood was born into slavery and was owned by Moses Tosi. He died in 1834 and Henrietta was sold away from her sisters and brothers, never to see them again. She was purchased by Henry Forsythe, a Louisville merchant, for $700. Wood was only 14 years old. In an interview, Wood said that Forsythe was a pretty mean man. She kept house, worked on a steamboat, and at his Louisville hotel for two years. But when Forsythe's business failed, he sold her. Another Louisville merchant, William Syrode, who was a French immigrant, earned his living tanning and selling leather, shoes, and boots. Seems he also fell upon hard times. In 1828, Syrode sold his tan yard in Lexington, Kentucky. In 1846, an advertisement in the Lexington Reporter advertised the sale of a likely Negro woman with two fine children and another expected in the Christmas holiday. It stated that she had been accustomed to housework, is an excellent cook, washer, and ironer, and occasionally has worked out in the garden and cornfield. Wood recalls that shortly after purchasing her for seven or eight hundred dollars, Saro took her at once on a steamboat to New Orleans, where he kept a retail and wholesale grocery store. She stayed with him and his family for seven years. William Sarod had loaned a generous amount of capital and goods to his sons for their businesses. But when they were unable to pay solicitors, creditors went after their father. Perhaps to avoid paying these debts, Sarod returned to France in 1844, leaving his wife, Jane, behind. Wood stated that the family financial problems created many quarrels in the home. Before returning to France, William gave Jane some additional black. Jane Creole returned to Louisville and hired out Wood for four years before they moved to Cincinnati, Ohio, a free state. In 1848, Creole was running a boarding house and she freed Wood and registered her as a free person. Free at last, Wood began earning her living as a domestic. Her living infuriated some of Creole's children, who were counting on the human inheritance of Wood along with the other slaves. Her freedom meant money out of their pockets. Josephine, Jane's daughter, was married to Robert White, a failed businessman. They returned to Kentucky and contested her mother's right to manumit wood. Jane died in 1853. Damn. Knowing that wood was free, that year, the Whites schemed to reclaim their perceived loss inheritance and hatched a plan to get their due. They tricked Wood's employer into taking a trip with her to nearby Covington, Kentucky. As soon as they arrived, Covington Deputy Sheriff Zebulon Ward and three other men were waiting to kidnap. Wood recalled one of the men saying, Now, don't run or I'll shoot you. They handed her employer some money and took off. Kidnapping free blacks was not uncommon at this time. For a few nights, Wood was imprisoned at roadside inns as they made their way to a plantation in Lexington, Kentucky. She told an innkeeper, 
what had happened and he was sympathetic. He filed a lawsuit on her behalf, declaring that she was a free woman. But there was no documented proof. Her freedom papers had been burned in a courthouse fire in Cincinnati in 1849. Under the terms of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, Wood had no defense and was not entitled to a trial or to testify on her own behalf. She was held in a slave pen in Lexington for a year, charged with being a runaway slave. The sympathetic innkeeper persisted with the lawsuit for two years, but without the freedom papers, nothing could be proven. After the verdict in 1855, Wood was taken to Natchez, Mississippi for auction. She was purchased by Gerald Brandon, eldest son of the former Mississippi governor. Wood was re-enslaved for 16 years. The Brandon family had several plantations and owned 700 to 800 slaves. Wood said, I sewed the cotton, hoed the cotton, and picked the cotton. I worked under the meanest overseas and got flogged and flogged until I thought I should die. Conditions on Brandon plantations were brutal. Wood describes overseers tying women to four stakes and giving them hundreds of lashes with a leather strap. Wood recalled that they had been used to beat the slaves with bull whips but they killed so many of them that they had to use straps instead. If you did not walk fast enough to please the overseer or pick quite enough cotton or even looked away from your work, you got whipped. Here, Wood became pregnant and gave birth to her son, Arthur. At the end of the Civil War, she should have been free. However, instead of liberation, Brandon ordered 300 slaves to march 400 miles to Texas. They continued to work in cotton fields. Despite Juneteenth liberating slaves in Texas, it wasn't until she returned to Mississippi with Brandon in 1866 that Wood gained her freedom. Wood signed a contract with Brandon's family to work for $10 a month. She never saw a dime of pay and decided to seek life with her son elsewhere. In 1869, Wood returned to Cincinnati, Ohio, but she was not satisfied. Embittered by the mischief that cost her 16 years as a slave, she promptly began planning a lawsuit against Zebulon Ward, now a wealthy man, for kidnapping and selling her into slavery. In 1870, Wood obtained the services of lawyer Harvey Myers and began litigation in federal court. The trial, Wood v. Ward, took place in 1878 and was presided by Judge Philip Swing. They asked for $20,000 in retribution. Ward's lawyers sought many delays and argued that her failed antebellum suit for freedom proved his innocence. They also argued too much time had passed for legal consideration, which was a recurring argument against reparations. The all-white jury awarded her $2,500, which she received in 1879, after much resistance from Ward. Though the amount seems small by today's standards, it is equal to $65,000 in 2019 dollars and remains the largest award ever given for slavery reparation. Wood's successful trial did not begin a trend of similar reparations cases, and though it received national press coverage at the time, was largely forgotten in the following years. Wood's case was written about in the media. 
Lefkadia Hearn wrote of it in the Cincinnati commercial. The New York Tribune acknowledged that, though a landmark case and award, don't expect this to spark other cases they wrote. Not so many complications of a legal nature arise out of the old relations of master and slave as might have been expected. Judge Philip Swing, who presided over Wood's case, instructed the jurors to consider slavery a thing of the past. He said, Fortunately for this country, the institution of slavery has passed away, and we should not bring our particular issues of the legality or morality of an institution of that character into court or the jury box. Swing was implying that paying out large monetary reparations wouldn't be fair to slave owners who regretted buying and selling human beings but the past is the past. After the victory, Wood moved to Chicago to live with her son, Arthur H. Sims. Now the lesson about what reparations can do. Wood used her restitution money to finance Arthur's education at Union College of Law, now Northwestern University, Pritzker School of Law. He was one of the first black graduates and enjoyed a long career as a lawyer in Chicago during the first half of the 20th century. The Costs and Awards of Slavery Wood received $2,500 as compensation for more than 16 years of unpaid labor due to her kidnapping. One of the men who spearheaded this atrocity General Zebulon Ward became very wealthy after slavery. Perhaps he received reparations for his enslaved he had to release. But while the former enslaved did not get 40 acres or a mule, Ward worked as a steamboat clerk, then owner, was promoted from deputy sheriff in Covington to sheriff. He served in the Confederate Army during the Civil War years. He made most of his money, though, as a leasee of black convict labor at Kentucky Penitentiary. This allowed him to move into the wealthy class, becoming a Woodford County farmer. And he was elected to the Kentucky legislature. Not bad for a slave kidnapper, Ward built generation wealth for his heirs, leaving an estate worth at least $600,000 when he died in 1894, a multimillionaire by today's standards. Beginning in the 1800s, former enslaved persons sought reparations or pensions for their labor during slavery. They regularly met at conventions as seen in 1916 pictures. Over 50 years after emancipation, they met in Washington, D.C. for the 1926 Slavery Convention. They again petitioned the federal government for slavery pensions. It was denied again. Ward never admitted fault for Wood's re-enslavement. On the memorandum line of the check, he wrote, quote, to pay for the last Negro that will ever be paid for in this country, end quote. Perhaps he is sadly right. According to economic anthropologist Jason Pickle, the United States extracted $97 trillion of value from the enslaved people.